to these sorts of things. But uh, I'd really love, I mean, is there anything specifically you would like to go into from a deep ecology or guide point of view? Or maybe, I think, you know, we've, we've really touched on <coughs> what Gaia is and we've touched on the brilliance of the ecology. <coughs> Um, I've got one or two follow-up questions on Jung towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great point to bring in. Um, now, seeing that it's the decade of restoration... Uh -huh, about rest ecological restoration. About ecological restoration. What, are the, what can we do as individuals and as organizations no, knowing, that, knowing what we know of Gaia? Okay. So we can transition from knowing that to... Okay. Right. Well, the thing is, we humans can't be happy and whole unless nature is happy and whole. I mean, that's obvious. We we know now from the science that we need biodiversity to absorb carbon, to produce cloud seeding chemicals, basically to regulate the climate of the earth. We have to have healthy biodiversity. That's that's because of we know that because of Lovelock, basically. So, even from a purely functional scientific point of view, we, n we can make an excellent case, and people are understanding this more and more now, that we can't have a healthy human society, or a healthy economy, or whatever we want, unless nature is healthy. So we can't. I mean, if we destroy all the rainforests and pollute all the oceans, then what's going to regulate the climate? Nothing. It's going to go berserk, like it's going berserk now. So, even from a purely scientific point of view, it's well established now that biodiversity is, is essential for human well-being and human health. There's a very anthropocentric way of looking at it. But okay, people are concerned about humans, quite rightly. If you want a nice, happy children, nice, happy people, nice, happy society, you've got to have wild biodiversity. Because it's not, wild biodiversity isn't just something for, for rich eco-tourists to enjoy. It actually helps to regulate the climate of the earth. So that's the first thing. I think that's understood more and more and more and more. But also psychologically, you know, we are nature. We came out of nature. We are nature. And if we want to have a healthy psychological life, we've got to have a healthy nature. We've got to have biodiversity, wild biodiversity in nature. What makes us really happy, apart from our own relationships with each other, is spending time in the forest, in wild forest, in a forest that's brought itself from out of itself, not a sort of managed human forest like a palm oil plantation, but a forest that's been itself, brought itself from out of itself, like the wild bush in Africa, which I experienced at Sengwa, you know, the miracle of this incredible complexity that was brought about without any human intervention whatsoever, it just came out of itself over millions and millions of years. We've got to have a good connection with that, with that ancientness and that incredible creativity of nature. Otherwise, we can't feel good. We, we won't be healthy psychologically. So that's why it's very important to rewild. I would say it's re important to rewild on two levels, therefore. One is we need to rewild so the Earth, Gaia, can regulate her climate so that we can have a happy life. And we need to rewild ourselves psychologically <coughs> um, through rewilding nature. Once we rewild nature, we realize wild parts of ourselves that we didn't know existed. You know, we have a connection with the elephant, we have a connection with aardvark, we have a connection with a robin, or just a little piece of wild, a little wild area, like in England here, everything's been so destroyed ecologically, but there are little patches, you know, which are still more or less wild, and when you go into one of those, you f I, anyway, feel a, just a sense of relief. Ah, oh, this place hasn't been destroyed messed around for about 20 years, like my jungle garden here, hasn't been touched for 30 years, I haven't touched it for 30 years, apart from cutting a little path through it, it's just been left alone, and when I go in there and I sit there, it's my sit spot, where I, where I spend a lot of time just sitting, it's so fantastic to see all these tangled branches, and you know, bramble, and nettle, and birds, and it's wild, and when I sit there, I, I feel really great, I feel rewilded in myself, but of course, the mainstream culture would say, oh, how untidy, we need to cut it all down and tidy it up and turn it into a vegetable garden. Well, of course we need vegetable gardens, but we also need wild places like that for us to connect with. Because when you do that, you start to feel the soul of nature. And 
The soul of nature is your own soul. The soul of nature is the human soul. They're indissolubly connected. So it's very important to rewild for all those reasons. Climate control, climate regulation, but also for our own psychological health. And also because all the wild animals, plants, beings, bacteria, fungi, viruses, they all have intrinsic value. They all need a home. They all have a value in themselves. They have a right to exist just as much as we do. I like what Aldo Leopold said, a great American environmentalist or ecologist, that we humans are just plain members of the biotic community. We're just members of this huge community of life, just like earthworms, bacteria, fungi, plants. We're just members of this great community. We're not really in charge of it, and we shouldn't be in charge of it. You know, we're, we're, we're too egocentric, we humans. We think, particularly in Western humans, we think that we're in charge. We're not humble enough. We have no ecological humility. We think we can do anything like Bolsonaro cutting down the Amazon to grow whatever, soya beans or whatever. And that's a, he's going to be very regretful of that in the future. We all are. It's a wrong attitude. We should be humble in the face of nature. We should allow nature to, her own space and her own growth and, and uh, creativity because ultimately that's good for her but also good for us. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to move this quickly. So I'm ranting away, aren't I? No, no, no you're not. <coughs> this is why we have a company called Rewild. Yeah, yeah, so, Rewild is very important. You know, like being able to. Sorry, I can take that water there. Can I? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um. My mouth gets very dry for, no, with this sort of thing. Especially if you're not feeling well. Yeah. Thirty years, yeah. Next year is thirty years. Yeah, next year is thirty years. What what an incredible achievement! And like, I think like the fact that it hasn't been easy, it's been a challenge, you know, is what made it hard. It is at least still exists and it's alive. And I guess off the back of that, you know, what gives you hope? <coughs> hmm. What gives me hope? Let me see. Well, what gives me hope is that. People like you, people who come here, um, can feel these things and understand these things and act on these things. So what gives me hope, I, I suppose, is the, the fund fundamental nature of the human psyche, which is nature itself. I mean, we are nature. So we can find that. If, if we look for it, we can find it. Um, so that gives me hope that basically the human psyche is nature. We are nature. And this great unconscious is you know, in our dream life, and it's nature speaking to us. So I suppose another thing that gives me hope is the fact that nature always speaks to us through our dreams, through our some fantasies, it's always speaking to us. It's always there waiting for us to rediscover her. So we just have to make that move to, towards nature with humility. And, well, there's still a chance for us to find that. But the chances are now narrowing very much. There isn't much time left before the whole global ecosystem flips into a very unpleasant state. I think that's a very good point to go on. I think I'll never forget you sitting down and telling me about the... Uh, you know, it's good to be hopeful, but people need to know why they need to be hopeful. Well, not hopeful. The problem in that like, little curve where the ball is yeah. kind of at the bottom... Yeah. It's moved its way itself there, the self-regulation over these millions of years of mm -hmm. work that the Earth's done. Mm -hmm. And we're pushing that ball up into potentially yeah. another state. Of That's right. Can yeah. talk to that and like just explain that sometimes. Like we, if we don't become conscious of the yeah. fact that we are pushing it into a new pushing it up into a new state of regulation, yeah. that the Earth will exist without us. But yeah. I, mean, I mean, your thoughts on that? Well, this isn't these are these are not my thoughts, these are the th thoughts of really the most eminent scientists in this field, some of whom have taught here, or been here, like uh, Tim Lenton at Exeter University, and various other great scientists. Um, and they're, what they're finding is that, as you say, that, uh, uh, well, I suppose it's the idea of a tipping point, <laughs> where, you know, you can, say you take a, put a pen on a table, and you can keep pushing it towards the edge of the table, and nothing much happens, because it's still in a stable state. 
that once it gets to the edge of the table, close to the edge of the table, the same disturbance that pushed it further towards the edge, the same disturbance, can make it flip and the pen or pencil will fall to the floor to another state. And that's what we've been doing. We've been pushing the earth a bit more climate change, a bit more destruction of rainforests and coral reefs, etc. We think, oh, and see, nothing much happened, nothing much happened. And then suddenly, bang. And that's what's happening now. The earth is, well, maybe it's not quite happening yet, or maybe it is, but it, it's certainly very close to a sort of series of tipping points. One is like a domino effect, one tipping point. Say the Amazon, now let's say that the first one could be uh, the ice, the Greenland ice cap slowly melting, and that would set another tipping point. For example, the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Gulf Stream could slow down or stop, and that will set another tipping point. And of course, as we warm the Earth, more and more tipping points come into play. And the science now is showing that we're, we're very close to moving the Earth into an irreversible and very rapid transition to a hot state. And we may already be in that process, or we may have time to avoid the worst of it. Um, but you can see there's climate disruption all over the planet right now, everywhere. Every single part of the planet. Is how there's more floods and more droughts, and fires in Australia, fires in California. Here, unprecedented flooding, incredibly heavy rain. I'm sure it's a similar things are going on in Africa. So... And more and more people are realizing, hang on, this re things are really happening now. On the radio here in England, I constantly are hearing, to my delight, talking about carbon emissions, carbon reduction, you know, electric cars, Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion. There seems to be a ramping up of ecological awareness. I hope it's going to really make an, an impact. At the moment it hasn't, but let's hope it does. Sorry, I ramped it. I don't know if you, what do you think on the then, you know, there's some amazing people like uh, Greta and mm. from a leadership side. Yeah, it, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts on the world's leadership and, and, and what really is needed in that transition into a, a wilder world? <coughs> well, I was hearing George Monbiot on the radio yesterday. You know John, George Monbiot? He's, he's a very um, important ecological writer and thinker. Uh, he actually helped me catch, catch Muntjac at Oxford. But anyway, that's another matter. So um, he says, he was, a, he was saying he was a leader himself you know, in the environmental movement. Now he's a follower, and the leaders now are the young people, like Greta. They're the, young, they're the ones with the ecological consciousness, and we need to follow them. So I think the, the real leaders in this movement are now the young people. Uh, like Greta and all the, other, all the young people she's inspired. <clears throat> the actual political leaders, as you know, are completely hopeless. <clears throat> I mean, Trump is, of course, an utter disaster for the earth and for humanity. J Boris, well, we'll see. I mean, there's, there's some hope that Boris might do some good ecological things. I think he understands. He's got Zach Goldsmith in his cabinet, who's a very, very good ecologist. So, but we, have, we need to listen to the young people. I'd like to see the young people take control of government. <laughs> it's a bit crazy, but they're the ones who are the leaders. We have to follow them, like George Monbiot was saying. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, um, no, we're, we're coming towards the end, and mm. I really, really appreciate this time that we've had with you. Honestly, I was in my head, I was like, I'm going to really look back at this. It's one of the key moments, the things that you're saying. And I think one thing that is... Uh, so important to maybe come across is people are, are beginning to understand and maybe you know like uh, Paul says inconvenient truths mm -hmm. triggers people to think okay the climate change is really happening but nothing's flipping people in the sense that we are rapidly losing biodiversity biodiversity is 67 percent yeah. of our ver vertebrate species are lost by this year between i'm not sure what year it started but uh, yeah 1970 and 2020 yeah and it's often, I think, this idea of, um, you know, climate change is an egg that you cannot really unscramble. Mm -hmm. And an ecological loss, well, that's an egg you, you would never unscramble. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, can't, you can't bring an ecosystem back. No. <coughs> that's right. I think we focused quite rightly on climate, you know, carbon dioxide emissions, methane, etc. But we've tended to ignore biodiversity. 
and the two are completely interrelated. That's what James Lovelock has shown. You know, climate and biodiversity are like this. They're in a mutual relationship of feedback. So we have to focus on both, and we need to big up the loss of biodiversity because biodiversity is what regulates the climate, what keeps a, 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 a nice, well, has kept the nice, stable climate we've had for the last 11,500 years or so since the last ice age, you know, the Holocene stable state. So we need to focus on, bio, on biodiversity loss, and people need to understand that biodiversity isn't just an, a nice sort of pretty postcard sort of thing for rich eco-tourists to go and enjoy, you know, in the safaris to Africa and things. Uh, it's absolutely vital for the climate. If you destroy the biodiversity, you destroy the climate. If you destroy the climate, you destroy the biodiversity. They're like that. It's Gaia. We're talking about Gaia. Gaia is the integrated living system of biodiversity, life, atmosphere, that's to say CO2 and other greenhouse gases, water and rocks. They're like this. Lovelock says it's like a tight marriage, like a good marriage. And we need to understand that we're part of this huge, great living system. Like David Abraham would say, my friend, American philosopher, um, we have two bodies. We have this body, which is our little human body, and this little human body lives inside a much larger body, a round spherical body, which is the animate Earth, which is Gaia. We're deep inside Gaia, at the bottom of her atmosphere. So that she is our second body, she's our larger body. We have two bodies. Now would you, would you, would you cut out your lungs to sell them you know, for profit? Of course you wouldn't. But that's what we're doing with the Amazon and with all the, all the other wild places. We're cutting them down, destroying them, mining them. To make money out of them is like mining your liver, mining your lungs. It's completely bonkers because we don't realize that the Earth is our body. I mean, it really is. It's our body. We came out of the Earth. You know, all these atoms and molecules that we're made out of, carbon atoms, sulfur atoms, phosphorus atoms, nitrogen, <coughs> they, all came, they all came out of the Earth, and when we die, they'll go back to the Earth. Why can't we understand that? It's the most basic ecological fact. Um, and we just don't get it in our culture, because we're too busy consuming, 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 consuming. We don't know about our origins. We don't know about where we've come from and, and what Gaia is and what the Earth is. And that needs to change fast. I think people need to, they need to get out into nature, even if it's a park or even if it's a window box in the city. You need, everyone needs to connect with some non-human or more than, or other than the human being, wherever they are. We need to reconnect with nature really fast. So important for people's health, psychological health, physical health and for the health of the planet. And then we'll, we'll consume less, not because the government tells us to, but because we love the earth. Arnie would say this, you know, that coercion really isn't very good. I mean, we may need coercion in the end, but it's much better if people act beautifully. A beautiful act is when you act because you, you know it's, it's the right thing to do. You just feel the beauty of, you see feeling again, you feel the beauty of nature. You act to protect nature because you feel its value. That's a beautiful act. So I think we need a massive program of reconnecting children, everyone with nature. This is why I think that um, uh, forest bathing is so important, for example. Or tracking, you know, with John Young, tracking. Um, forest bathing, Shinrin Yoku from the Japanese. Amos Clifford, my friend, he's written a lovely book about that. So we need to just get everybody, everybody in London to Hyde Park. We need to rewild Hyde Park. We get everyone just sitting down you know, just half an hour, just looking at the clouds. That's what we need. So people fall in love with nature, with Gaia, fast. We need massive falling in love with Gaia really quickly. I think there's so much, you know, we, there's a lot of talk, or at least in the world, generally of a dystopian future. I often think of people living in containers that, and they would be stacked on, on top of each other. And that is this future that we've essentially dreamed up. But I think we need a new dream. You know, yeah. We need to, to talk of a, a new dream that's a bit different. What, what's, what, what is the dream that you have for the future? Uh, what, <coughs> what would that look like? What would it feel like? Mm. What would it be like? It'd be like Schumacher College. <coughs> I mean, we're growing our own food here. <coughs> Not in an industrial way but in a community-based way, so everyone gets involved with growing the food. Mm, I go and help in the garden when I can, 
you know, weeding or composting. I just do what I'm told. Um, and we grow lots of food. Uh, and we need to have lots of small human style, and human, sorry, we need lots of small is beautiful communities after E.F. Schumacher, small is beautiful. I think that's the guideline, small is beautiful and local. Local communities in touch with their local ecology, growing food locally, making culture locally, playing music at night, telling stories, really knowing each other, working on the psyche, on one's psyche, um, meditating, you know, cultivating one's own inner life, but in a community with other people. And you do that all over the planet. And of course there are connections with other parts of the planet. There's some travel going on. Not like now, with jets are going all over the place, but limited travel for cultural exchange. We use the internet for cultural exchange, sure. But it's very much locally based, lo based in your local community and your local ecology, all over the planet. Small is beautiful. Small is beautiful. That is definitely the one, um, the three words that have travelled with three wilds. Mm -hmm. Throughout its, from its beginning to when we you know, saw South Africa's unique and biologically diverse ecosystems. And Sam and I spent about eight months um, mapping the uh, the best hiking trails for South Africa. Uh -huh. and we had to show this camera called Gary, Gary the Google Tracker. Uh -huh. and we showed uh, we showed Gary the most beautiful landscapes in the world. That was our that was our goal of South Africa to show the world the most beautiful landscapes. And um, and small really is beautiful, and that's the one thing that really I think has stood with us. So I'm very thankful, I think, to you and and to Schumacher College for something that you've really brought to, to Sam mm -hmm. and to us yeah. as an organisation. No, that's good, yeah. I mean, it's called Schumacher College after E.F. Schumacher, the economist, who coined the term, well, he used the, he used the phrase for his famous book, Small is Beautiful. So it's very important. There's one activist who's a very good friend of mine who taught the second course at Schumacher College, Helena norberg Hodge, and she's got an organisation called... Uh, local futures or economics of happiness so you know there's a whole lot of people working on this kind of approach to the future and i think that's the way we've got to go if we've got, got any hope of surviving but of course we're going in exactly the opposite direction well, it's uh, I mean, yeah it's uh, it's a lot to you yeah, it's a big reminder coming here all the a lot to me a lot of the emotions are going through i definitely Definitely, I, I'm, you know, between the relationship between Ali and I, I think, and the founders of our business, I'm very much the feeler. So uh -huh. is Ali, you know, Ali's an excellent thinker. Mm -hmm. So we complement each other quite well in, in yeah. the work that we do. And, you know, we both are trying to build, you know, how to be in the world. And it's, yeah, it's been inspiring to have had leadership like Schumacher College mm -hmm. myself and the leadership that we've had to, to, uh, to, to seek in the world. Is there anything that you would like to say? Don't think so. I think I've probably said too much already. Last question. Yeah. Um, 